Well, take your copy of God's Word and be finding your place with me this morning in Daniel chapter 2. Now, I told you a couple of weeks ago I wanted to just sort of step away from our study through Philippians for just a, a short time, and I promise we'll come back to it in a couple of weeks. We'll finish the second half of Philippians. But uh, the Lord really laid upon my heart uh, to deal with this issue of Christians and our involvement in uh, politics and that kind of thing. And the question that I brought up a couple of weeks ago is this question, what is the balance between our Christianity and our political involvement? How is it that we as believers take our faith with us into the ballot box? You know, in contentious times such as these, you and I need to be well informed about the issues which are really at stake in our nation. And, and we understand that politics and politicians, at their very best, they can never be our savior. Well, at the same time, we do understand that they can most certainly, at their very worst, be our downfall. Uh, good government, no matter how good it is, can never save us but folks, bad government can absolutely destroy us. And so it's sort of like that nursery rhyme. I know you're familiar with it, Humpty Dumpty. You remember? He sat on a wall and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Now, I don't know who ever came up with the story, but it's about an egg who sat on a wall, but this egg had a great fall. And, and you know the rest of the story. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Now, we don't know what happened. We don't know any of the particulars why he fell. Could be that he was pushed. Could be that a gust of wind came along, and, or maybe, maybe he got distracted and lost his balance. But what we do know is who he turned to to try to help get his act back together. He didn't turn to his family. He didn't turn to the church. He turned to the government. And, and the king got involved. And all the king's horses and all the king's men got involved. Congress got involved. They tried to pass a stimulus package. <laughs> but the point is, all of the king's manpower, all of the kingdom's ingenuity, the most powerful people in the land, those who had access to the halls of power, they couldn't fix the egg once it had been scrambled. And so it reminds you and me that government, no matter how good it is, it can never be our savior. I read something this week. I'm sure you've heard this, but Benjamin Franklin, when he gave his address at the Constitutional Convention in 1787... In June of that year, he, he, he petitioned for each morning of that constitutional uh, Congress to be convened with prayer. And he made this statement, I have lived, sir, a long time, and the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice... Is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? We've been assured, sir, in the sacred writings that except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And I firmly believe this, and I also believe that without his concurring aid, we shall succeed in this political building no better than the builders of Babel. We will be divided by our little partial local interests, our projects will be confounded and we ourselves shall become a reproach and a byword down to future generations. And so the point was he recognized that as they were convening to, to write the Constitution, out of that, con that, that meeting came the Constitution of the United States, but each morning they began on their knees seeking the God of heaven. Now, folks, listen to this. Psalm 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses. Some people put all of their confidence in all of the king's horses and all of the king's men, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. 
And so with that in mind, the book of Daniel gives us really the meaning of history more clearly than any other portion of the Bible. And it tells us as believers how to live out our faith in the midst of a difficult, even hostile environment. And honestly, I don't know of any other message more timely and valuable for believers living in a secular age such as we are. Daniel really gives us a prophetic framework for understanding the course of world history. Daniel presents Jesus Christ as the coming King of kings and Lord of lords who reigns over an everlasting kingdom which will never be shaken. And Daniel paints a picture of what it looks like to really walk with God in a countercultural way. And so in Daniel, we find this powerful example of someone who not only lived in chaotic times and survived those chaotic times, but he triumphed in the midst of those times as he lived his life in obedience to God. And Daniel didn't live as a hermit in those times, but he was actively engaged uh, in, in, in the world around him, even though it was foreign to everything that he had experienced as a young Jew. In a word, Daniel sought the welfare of the city to which he had been sent. In fact, Jeremiah, in his letter to the exiles, back in Jeremiah chapter 29, he tells uh, the people who are going to be carried away into captivity to seek the welfare of the city. In other words, get involved. Uh, Influence the world around you for the sake of righteousness. And so based on that, I believe there's an application for you and me as Christians uh, living in 2024. You and I ought to be involved as far as the political uh, process is concerned because we want to be salt, we want to be light, we want to influence the world around us for righteousness sake. Now we've already looked at Daniel chapter one and, and he's a young captive in Babylon at this point and so the book ultimately follows the deportation of Judah when Nebuchadnezzar, who was the king of Babylon, took the Jews away and carried them away captive to his city. And so Daniel, he's one of those captives. He's a young man taken away from his home in Jerusalem. He's forced to live out the remainder of his days in a strange place. He's even faced with the pressure of Babylonian indoctrination uh, to adopt the language and the lifestyle, the ways and the customs of the Babylonians. But verse eight of Daniel chapter one said that Daniel resolved in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's manner of living. And so even though he's faced with this pressure to conform, the Bible says that Daniel, he he really stands like an iron pillar in the midst of a hurricane and his faith is in the Lord God. But he doesn't withdraw or retreat, but he actively serves God and looks for opportunities and ways to be an influential figure for the sake of righteousness. And you'll see just how influential Daniel is as we come now to this second chapter. So Daniel chapter two, I want to invite you to stand with me as we read the scripture together this morning. Daniel chapter two, verse one, and I want to read through verse 23. The Bible says, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians and the enchanters, the sorcerers and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. And so they came in and stood before the king. And the king said to them, I had a dream and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb for limb and your houses shall be laid ruins. (laughs) That'll bless your heart. (laughs) But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. They answered a second time and said, let the king tell his servants the dream and we will show its interpretation. The king answered and said, I know with certainty that you're trying to gain time because you see that the word from me is firm. 
If you do not make the dream known to me, there is but one sentence for you. You've agreed to speak lying and corrupt words before me till the times change. Therefore, tell me the dream, and I shall know that you can show me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult. And no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. Oh, if only the divine would make himself human. (laughs) Wow. Well, we know the answer to that, don't we? Well, verse 12, because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out. And the wise men were about to be killed and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions, and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery, so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Now listen to this. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night, and Daniel blessed the God of heaven Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise, for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. I want to speak from this subject this morning, the revealer of mysteries. We learn from the second chapter of Daniel that our God, he is the revealer of mysteries. Lord, we thank you for your word. And we pray that you would speak into our hearts and lives in a powerful way. Lord, by your Holy Spirit, I pray that you would illuminate our understanding. God, as we look at the time in which we live, Lord, may the truth of your word come to bear in our lives in such a vivid way. Lord, so that we might be a light to those who are in the dark and point people to the hope that we have in Jesus. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Here in Babylon, Daniel is sovereignly placed in a position of influence. And really, his life illustrates how believers are in the world, though we are not of the world. We've been set apart as salt and light in a dark and tasteless world. And so by the time you reach the conclusion of the book of Daniel, Daniel is an old and distinguished leader who has served both a succession of kings in the Babylonian and the Medo-Persian empires. And so the the time of the book really spans the 70-year captivity in which the Jews were being held in Babylon. But most important of all, Daniel faithfully serves God, who's the one true king all throughout his life. And whenever he's faced with the choice of whether or not to serve a human king and conform to Babylon's worldview, or obey the king of the universe and submit to his word, Daniel always chose the latter. Daniel always chose obedience to God. And so the theme of the book of Daniel is the sovereignty of God over the lives of individuals, kings, and nations. And so as those who trust in such a God, we recognize that the the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. He's the Lord of both heaven and earth. 
All of earth's citizens are subject to him, whether they recognize it or not. And so this second chapter of Daniel shows us that God is indeed sovereign and in perfect control of world history. Now you understand that. The world is not spinning into oblivion. God is not in heaven wringing his hands wondering what's going on. He is sovereignly in control of it all. History is his story. And God is bringing his purposes to pass. And so this second chapter then begins with the dreams of the pagan king. Dreams which troubled him. Dreams which could not be interpreted by any of Babylon's wise men. In other words, there was a problem and no man had any answers. Does that sound familiar? Uh, the answer to the dilemma could not be solved by all of Babylon's prognosticators and, and commentators and magicians and wise men because the problem itself could not be solved by man. The solution had to be revealed by the God of heaven, which means God and only God could sort the situation out. Beloved, let me tell you something. Nebuchadnezzar's problem was with God. And when God is your problem, only God is your solution. And so you'll notice that that word reveal, it's used around seven times there in chapter two. You'll really see this toward the second half of the chapter. And the point being made is that God, he's the one who has the answers that you and I need. When all the king's horses and all the king's men could never uh, put the problem together and come up with a solution to the issue, you and I know that God in heaven, he's the revealer of mysteries. He's the one who is sovereign and in control. And we look to him in faith. And so from this text, notice with me, first of all, what I would call the insufficiency of Babylon's wisdom. And you really see this in the first several verses. Now, we know that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, he was powerful. He had been successful. He was the leader of the most powerful nation on earth for 43 years. It was the Greek historian Herodotus who wrote of how impressive Babylon was under King Nebuchadnezzar. If you know a little bit of the history, it was situated on the Euphrates River. The city itself was a perfect square, each side spanning 14 miles it had a massive walled enclosure that was some 56 miles long, anchored by 250 watchtowers, each one 450 feet tall. The wall around the city itself was 300 feet high, 25 feet thick, backed up by another wall that was 75 feet. There was a moat that surrounded the entire complex. There were eight massive gates, uh, including the Ishtar Gate, which was embedded within the city walls. I know that you've heard of Nebuchadnezzar's famous Hanging Gardens, which was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. These bloomed lavishly. They were irrigated by hydraulic pumps that brought up water from the Euphrates River. Now, despite all of that uh, luxury and all of that architecture and wealth, History reveals that Nebuchadnezzar was a very proud man. He was a cruel man, a man who crushed his enemies with a vengeance. He was an egotistical maniac who appeared to have arrived at the apex of power in his day. And you would think that he would sleep easy with all of those accomplishments under his belt. But the Bible says that that was certainly not the case. You ever heard the Shakespearean quote, uneasy lies the head that wears the crown? In other words, there's a lot of pressures that are associated with leadership. The least of which I can't even imagine the pressures associated with leading a nation. But it's not often that we're given a private glimpse into the thoughts of such an individual. But here in Daniel chapter 2, that's exactly what happens. Notice the king's dreams. Because the chapter begins by telling us that Nebuchadnezzar is having these dreams that greatly trouble him. And the language of the text is such that these were essentially recurring dreams. Dreams that kept happening over and over again. And his spirit was so bothered by it that one night he found himself unable to go back to sleep. The word says that he's troubled. And that word means to be greatly disturbed deep within the core of his heart. Deep within the core of his soul. 
He's been having these dreams that he knew were significant, but he's totally incapable of understanding it. As I read this, I was reminded of a, of a clip from a movie. You remember Close Encounters of the Third Kind where Richard Dreyfuss' character, he's, he's got the fork and the plate of mashed potatoes, and he's sitting there forming the, you know, the devil's tower out of that mashed potatoes, and he says, this means something. He didn't know what it meant, but it meant something. Nebuchadnezzar has been having all of these dreams and it's almost as if he's saying, this means something, but I don't know what it means. And so what does he do? Well, he calls all of the wise men together. Uh, he, he tells these wise men, guys, I've been having these dreams. Here's what I want you to do. You tell me the dream and also the interpretation. In other words, he's not going to tell them what the dream itself was. He wants them, if they were truly wise men, who had a clear channel to the gods of Babylon, uh, then surely they could tell him what the dream was and they could offer an interpretation. Now we'll find out later on in the chapter that the dreams that Nebuchadnezzar had been having, uh, it was God showing him what was going to happen on the future world stage. Daniel's going to interpret the dream. He's going to show the meaning of the dream. The dream itself was of a massive statue that was made up of different types of metals. You had gold and silver and bronze. And then the, 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 the feet and the toes were made of iron, clay. There was just this mixture. And it was really a dream of su succession of world empires, beginning with Nebuchadnezzar himself, leading up all the way until the, the last days when the Lord Jesus Christ will come and set up a kingdom which will never be shaken. Right. And Daniel is the only one who's able to offer the interpretation of the dream. But the point that I want you to understand here, God is communicating to this pagan king. You know what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 21, verse one? Listen to this. The king's heart is a stream of water in the hand of the Lord and he turns it wherever he will. Don't think that things simply just happen. Don't think that things in our world, whether it be the decrees that are offered by presidents or whether it be the, the, the uh, conquests that are launched by dictators around the world, don't think that things just happen. Ladies and gentlemen, our God is in control and his purposes will never be thwarted. And you need to remember that whenever you scroll through your news feed or you watch uh, the news at night or you read the latest headlines, you need to remember that the Bible says that God ultimately, he's the one who's on the throne. And so this reassurance is exactly what God's people needed to know. All of those who were exiles in Judah, they needed to know that the God of Israel had not been defeated and that the gods of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians were not victorious but that God had allowed all of this to happen because God had a very real purpose behind it all. And so the king's dreams then give way to the king's demand. He calls for his cabinet. He wants these men to offer the interpretation of the dream, but they can't do it. And it's something that infuriates Nebuchadnezzar. Now think about it, in his mind, they're the ones who are paid to study the stars, to have insight into the mysteries of life, and yet here they are standing before the most powerful man on earth at the time, and they're forced to admit that there's not a man on earth who could meet the king's demand. And they say the thing that the king asks is difficult. Verse 11, no one can show it to the king except the gods whose dwelling is not with flesh. So all of Babylon's wisest, brightest men were incapable of seeing and discerning the dream that had come from God. And listen, it's a reminder to me of how the wisdom of this world, it's nothing but foolishness to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they're foolishness to him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. If man is ever to figure out his place in his world, he's got to know the creator first and foremost. Because without knowledge of the creator, mankind is no better than a dog chasing its own tail. And that's exactly the predicament of those in our world who don't know God. They're trying to solve political problems and they're trying to solve 
uh, economic problems and financial problems and their family problems and individual problems. You can't even begin to solve problems unless you know the God of heaven who's the revealer of mysteries. So the very best that his kingdom had to offer was no help to King Nebuchadnezzar. Because when it comes to providing solutions, beloved, Babylon's wisdom is insufficient. And it's proof, an illustration of how the world, with all of its astrology and all of its pseudoscience and all of its false religion and political theory and philosophy, cannot unlock the mysteries of life and understand the meaning of life apart from the truth that's revealed by the Spirit of God. Reminded of what Jesus prayed on one occasion. He said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. You've hidden these things from the wise and understanding, and you've revealed them to little children. My friend, if you know the God of heaven, and you have a personal relationship with his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you understand where history's headed, listen, you're better off, far better off in terms of wisdom than the brightest PhD that this world has to offer who doesn't know the God of heaven. They may have a lot of education, but they have absolutely no wisdom. Because wisdom begins with the fear of God, according to what the word says. So then the king's decree. Nebuchadnezzar's frustrated at this point. Verse 12 says he's angry and furious and commands that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. And so the decree goes out. He recognizes that his royal advisors can offer him no solutions, and so he gives the order to have them all executed. Now, the thing is, this is going to have a trickle-down effect because it's going to impact Daniel and his three friends. Even though they were in the lower ranks at this particular point, their lives were on the line. And so here's a political decision from the top that had personal repercussions and consequences. You say, well, why should believers be involved in politics and the political process in our own time? I'll tell you why. Because decisions that are made at the top have a trickle-down effect that impact my life and your life. And so you and I had better be involved for the sake of righteousness and truth. So the insufficiency of Babylon's wisdom. Now notice the second thing from this passage, and it's the importance of Daniel's faith. Daniel's faith is on display there, really beginning in verse number 13. The decree from Nebuchadnezzar goes out. The wise men are about to be killed. They sought Daniel and his companions to kill them also. Now listen to this, though. The Bible says that Daniel replies with prudence and discretion. Man, isn't that the mark of a believer? Isn't that a believer? He's not throwing up his hands in panic and frustration. He's not pitching a hissy fit and that kind of thing. No, he replies with prudence and discretion to the captain of the king's guard. And he says, why is the decree of the king so urgent? The Bible says Arioch makes the matter known to Daniel and Daniel goes in and requests the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. So here you see Daniel and his three friends, once again, they find themselves between a rock and a hard place there in Babylon. And through no fault of their own, they learn that they've been sentenced to die. Now, if the bottom's fallen out of life, I imagine this is it for them. Uh, But they don't resort to panic. They don't fall back to a self-preservation mode. This becomes an opportunity for them to exercise faith in the Lord. And so I want you to see at least three ways that Daniel's faith is on display here in this text. The first way that it's on display is through the composure that he shows. He's got composure in a crisis. He's replying with prudence and discretion. His reaction's not knee-jerk, but it's level-headed. It's calm. He's got a composure that comes from a mind that's been informed by the truth. A heart that looks to God, the one who's sovereign, the one who's in perfect control of his situation. Reminds me of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, where the Bible says that our God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind, self-control. It's the same poise and the same pressure, that attitude uh, that Jesus himself demonstrated. The prophet Isaiah says he's oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. 
like a lamb that's led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. It's the same composure that Stephen demonstrates when he's standing there before the Sanhedrin, about to be stoned for his faith. And the Bible says there in Acts that everyone who looked upon his face saw that it was as the face of an angel. That's composure in the midst of the crisis. Now, folks, it's basic human nature to want to defend yourself when you're under attack. It's basic human nature to want to get ugly even when everything that you hold near and dear is being threatened. Whether it be false accusation or feeling mistreated or whether it be an injustice of some kind. But here's the thing. You can allow fear, uh, the fear of not being in control of your situation. You can allow that to lead you to say some things and do some things and act some ways that will hurt your Christian testimony. It's very important in the midst of a political season with all of the rhetoric going back and forth that you and I not say things to hurt our Christian testimony. I'll be honest, I... I'm not too excited about the fact that my name has been taken and used as a political slogan in our own time that means something very debased. Let the hearer understand. The bottom line is you can get caught up in all that and you can act no differently than the world around you when it comes to expressing your views on issues. But beloved, we've got to be motivated and under the control and the leadership of the Holy Spirit as we give witness to the truth of the gospel. Not allowing ourselves to get in the flesh. The wrath of man doesn't do a thing. So Daniel doesn't, he doesn't get down in the dirt and wallow with the hogs. No, he's a man with poise, with composure, even though he's under fire because faith and not fear is driving his decisions and his reactions at this point. Now, a second way that his faith is seen is the courage that he shows. He's got composure in a crisis, but notice the courage that he has before the king. There in verse 15, he makes this bold move where he calmly asks the king's captain why the king's decree is so urgent. And so he then has an opportunity to go before the king. And that's a bold move because no person ever went into the king's presence without an invitation first. And for Nebuchadnezzar to give him time, this is highly unusual because he had condemned his own cabinet for asking the same thing. But keep in mind what was said of Daniel back in chapter one, verse 17. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. Now listen to this. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So here you have Daniel who has faith in God. The favor of God is on his life. And God had so arranged the circumstances of his life for such a time as this. God's using all of that chaos brought about by Nebuchadnezzar's decree to bring Daniel to the top so that Daniel can have an audience with Nebuchadnezzar so that Daniel can interpret God's word to the most powerful man in the land. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? He's in Babylon for this very moment. And then notice the confidence that he has on his knees. That's the third way that his faith is on display. Verse 17, he goes to his house. He makes the matter known to his friends and companions, and he tells them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. In other words, he got together with his fellow believers and had a prayer meeting. When there was a political decision that had been made that would have repercussions that would affect their own life, what did they do? They get together and they take the matter to God in prayer. Beloved, I believe with everything within me that you ought to vote this election cycle. And your vote ought to be informed by truth. And you stand on the side of truth and what's right as far as the issues are concerned. But more important than your ballot being cast for a candidate is whether or not you are praying and beseeching the God of heaven on behalf of our own nation. The Bible tells us to pray for those who are in authority. The Bible tells us to make every matter a matter of prayer. Don't be anxious about anything, Philippians chapter four says, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. 
And the result of this will be the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, guarding your mind and your heart in Christ Jesus. That means regardless of the outcome of an election, you don't have to abandon hope. You don't have to worry. Because you know who's in, listen, regardless of who sits in the Oval Office, we know who sits on the throne. Amen. We know who sits on the throne. There's a third thing in this text that I want you to see, and it's the insight of God's word. The insufficiency of Babylon's wisdom. There's, there's Daniel's faith, which is there on display the importance of his faith, and then the insight of God's word there seen in verse 19. The Bible says that the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. And then notice what Daniel does in response to God revealing the mystery. The Bible says that he blesses the God of heaven. And he says, blessed be the name of God forever and ever to whom belong wisdom and might. Now listen to the statements that he makes about God here. He says, he changes times and seasons. He's the one who removes kings and sets up kings. In other words, he's the one who puts people in political office and removes them from political office. You say, well, hold on a second. I thought we had a chance to vote and our nation votes. Hey, listen, regardless of how our nation votes, God's the one who puts people in positions of power. That's what the word of God says. God's the one who's in control. Uh, He's the one who sets up kings. He's the one who gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. Now listen to this. He reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. And you would think with all of the issues that are swirling about in our own time and nobody seems to have any issues. Listen, isn't it a fair statement to say that society is in the dark? The world around us is completely in the dark. But as that, those who know the Lord God, the Bible says light dwells with him. What is it that man needs most? He needs light. He needs the light of truth. He needs the Holy Spirit of God to turn the light switch on and his darkened mind and heart. Mankind needs to be born again. He needs to know God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God's own son. So here's the point. Daniel is taking this matter to God in prayer and God supplies him with spiritual insight into his situation. You'll notice what's shown to Daniel there. God tells Daniel, here's the dream that Nebuchadnezzar has been having and here's what it means. And we'll get into that next time. But the point is, God had hidden some prophetic truth in the king's dream, and he enabled only Daniel to both know the dream and its interpretation. And it all had to do with God's future plan concerning the nations. And so upon being shown this, Daniel worships. What's your response when God really speaks to your heart from his word? You know, my prayer, you come to church week in and week out and you spend time in a D group week in and week out. Listen, thank God for fellowship and being together and that kind of thing. But boy, I tell you, I need to hear from God when we come together, don't you? When the word of God's opened up and I'm reading my Bible, I I don't need to hear it just for information's sake, but man, God, I need you to show me something about who you are. Remind me of the truth that I've forgotten because of my own sin, my own weakness, my own limitation. Remind me, oh God, of my great need for the Lord Jesus Christ. Remind me, oh God, when the enemy comes along and wants to discourage me and wants me to think that my sin is still there hanging before me. Remind me of the precious truth of your word that you've taken my sin and you've separated it from me as far as the east is from the west. Remind me that I'm covered in the blood of Jesus and I've been given the righteousness of Christ. Remind me of truth that I often forget. He's the revealer of mysteries. He's the one who has light when we're in the dark. And then what's shared by Daniel there in his prayer. I love how he praises the wisdom of God to begin with. Unbelief, when it comes to problems, unbelief looks to all the king's horses and all the king's men. But faith looks to God. And for those who want to keep God out of politics, 
Those who claim that Jesus isn't Lord at their political rallies, you better think again. You can't read the Bible and ignore the political realm. Did you know that? Because the Bible's packed, I mean jam-packed with political concerns involving laws and statutes and kingdoms and empires and kings and courts and taxes. And yet God is active on every page involved in the political affairs of mankind in both blessing and judgment. He's the one who establishes governments and dismantles them. And he's the one who places his people in strategic places while removing others from their proud political perches. Because God is the revealer of mysteries. God is the one who's sovereign. And Daniel is praising God for his wisdom. Daniel is praising God for his ways. He says he changes times and seasons. And he's expressing his confidence here that no matter how powerful a ruler might be, God is still sovereign over the affairs of life. And he praises God for God's willingness there at the end of his prayer. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. So God is willing to give us the insight that we need. Now listen, let me personalize this for just a moment. Is there insight into a situation that you desperately need in your own life? You're faced with the problem. You're faced with issues. There doesn't seem to be any answers or any solutions. You may be tempted to look to all the king's horses and all the king's men to try to get your act together again. But faith looks to the Lord Jesus Christ, even when we don't understand. We look to him in faith. We look to him in trust. And God is the one who speaks into our situations by means of his word. I'll tell you something, folks. Our nation needs the wisdom of God. We need some godly Daniels that the Lord will place in strategic places that can influence people for righteousness' sake. Because let me tell you, the world can't get its act together on its own. The world needs a Savior. The world needs Jesus. And if I may be so bold as to make a statement, I hope you understand my sentiment behind this statement. The ultimate mission of the church isn't to save America, but Americans. And that's only something that you and I can do because the issues, the issues that we're dealing with in our, our own time are merely symptomatic of a nation that's abandoned the truth of God and is worshiping idols. And all the issues are mere byproducts of worshiping idols. And the answer to that is repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and a church that's bold, that will preach the truth without apology. Christian men and women who will live for the purpose of making disciples among their neighbors, making disciples among our own nation, making disciples among the nations of the world and pointing people to the Lord Jesus Christ who's the revealer of mysteries. Let's stand as we pray this morning. I've got so much more I could say, but I've got to stop. <laughs> Daniel goes to God with a burden. He seeks the mercy of God, the wisdom of God, the will of God, and the Bible says that God revealed to him the mystery of the king's dream. Are you burdened this morning? Maybe you're burdened down by sin. And, and you say, Pastor, I'm not sure that if I died today that I would go to heaven. I'm not sure that I know Jesus as my Savior. My friend, it is not by coincidence that you're here this morning. Because we believe God brought you here this morning for such a time as this. If you feel like you're in chains and shackles, let me tell you about the chain breaker. And his name is Jesus. Don't look to all the king's horses and all the king's men to provide you with the solutions that you need. Because they don't have anything. Babylon's wisdom is insufficient for a broken, fallen world. What we need is heavenly wisdom. And the gospel tells me that the God of heaven stepped into our world in the person of his own son, lived a perfect, sinless life. And yet he went all the way to Calvary's cross 
to pay the price for my sin and your sin. And there on Calvary's cross, Jesus Christ bled and suffered and died for the sins of the world. And the scripture says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord Jesus shall be saved. Don't look to the king's horses and the king's men. Look to King Jesus. If you're a believer this morning and your heart's burdened over some issue, be encouraged by the fact that the Bible says that our God, he's the revealer of mysteries. He's the one who has answers. He's the one in whom we trust. He's the one to whom we ultimately look. Even in times of intense struggle, Lord, would you give the wisdom that we need? Would you bow with me this morning? In just a moment, we're going to sing. You need to respond this morning. and I invite you to do that. Maybe you, you need to come and talk with one of our pastors about salvation and baptism, church membership. Or maybe you just need to come and pray this morning for whatever reason. Lord, thank you for the freedom that we have. God, thank you for the wonderful truth that we're reminded of in this powerful passage of scripture that our God in heaven, he's the revealer of mysteries. Which means, Lord, that mankind in our own lost condition, we will never, ever be able to figure it out. We'll never be able to save ourselves, be it through political means or financial means or whatever. We need Jesus. We need the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord God, I pray for our nation. As many have already exercised their right to vote, God, I pray that there's not a person in this room that will ignore the opportunity and the responsibility that they have. And it's just one of many, many ways, Lord, that we can promote righteousness as your people. Now, looking at the issues, being informed by what your word has to say about issues such as life and marriage and Lord, a whole host of other things. God, my heart hurts this morning for the one who is confused, who's lost, who needs to be born again. Whether in the, they're in the room or whether they're watching online or maybe, Lord, it's even someone that we know of that's lost, that's in our families, that are on our minds. God, would you use us to be your mouthpiece and to point people to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the answer. In his precious name I pray, amen.